Hey everybody, just as a reminder, I'm a narrator on Chilling, the awesome horror app that features over 1,000 horror stories, over a dozen narrators, some of who you might know from YouTube, as well as full-length novels and exclusive series, and Chilling Originals. You can select and change the ambient sound on the background of these stories whenever you want without affecting the story that you're listening to, and we release hours of new stories every week. Click the link in the description to download and start your free trial to see if you like it. When you've lived somewhere long enough, you don't realize how strange it actually is. You believe what they tell you is normal. And if you don't dig too deep, the town that we live in appears heavenly. When you come to live in Agsbury, you sure are taken care of for the rest of your life. All the houses on all of our streets are beautifully crafted and there are specific individual ways to make a family feel welcome and happy. We are told this exact fact when we are assigned to help with a new house. It started out small many years ago. A tiny village with just the basic necessities. Like a small grocery store, a school, and a doctor's office but it has grown exponentially to a town with more than a thousand people. I can't say exactly what it looked like in the beginning, because that was way before I was even born. All I can say is that during the 16 years of my life, I've enjoyed living here. Every week, we have a big market in the center of town where we can buy everything that our hearts desire. When the market isn't there, we have a number of shops and boutiques run by the people that live here. There is a cinema and a theater and different clubs that you can join. It really is very seldom that a person or a family moves away from here, but when they do their house is renovated or a new one is built. During the last few months I helped with the finishing touches of the newest house in our town. It's especially exciting to me as it filled the empty spot right next to ours, meaning that we would be getting new neighbors soon. I kept waiting and waiting to see who the new people would be. Every day when I came home from school, I checked to see if they were there yet. When the holidays started, I began spending significantly more time sitting by the window in my room looking for a moving truck. When the new family finally moved in, I completely missed it. My friend Jules had stayed over and had fallen asleep watching the Grinch. We both woke up early in the morning from loud sounds and commotion coming from next door. We both jumped up to look out the window where we saw a few neighbors standing in front of the new house. With Jules right behind me, I ran downstairs to the kitchen where my parents and my little brother were having breakfast. Mom smiled when she saw me. No oh, good morning you two. Our neighbors arrived and I heard they have a son just your age. My dad, who was cooking some eggs and scraping the pan like crazy, didn't turn around or wish us a good morning. He looked like a rack. Mom laughed when she caught me looking at him. Oh, your dad didn't get a minute of sleep, she laughed. Finally, dad turned towards us. What an inconvenience moving into a new house in the middle of the night. Did you see them yet? Jules asked. Not yet, but I was going to go over soon with a basket of muffins. You girls can join me if you would like, Mom asked. My dad shook his head. Mary, maybe you should give them some time to settle in first. Jules looked disappointed and for some reason I felt the same way. I know that it might sound weird how big of a deal this is to all of us, but as I said before, Axberry was a bit different. And new people in such a small town can change a lot. Dad went to work and we all ignored what he had said. Mom had spent the morning baking muffins and filling a pretty wooden basket. She said that we still had dozens of them in the basement from back when we had moved here. So everybody's just gifting each other baskets back and forth. Jules asked. I saw a bunch of them in our place too. Jules had been my best friend ever since I could remember. She lived down the street and was almost like a sister to me. My mom chuckled. Well, it's not about the basket, it's about what's in it. And well, about the gesture. We want to make the new family feel welcome. 
The door was already open, but we still knocked. The house that I'd only seen empty was now filled with furniture, decorations, and at least six different baskets filled with muffins. Jules and I exchanged a look and try not to laugh. I guess it isn't about what's inside either. Oh, hello. A woman my mother's age approached the door. She was wearing a yellow dress. Her black hair framed her face that had at least three layers of makeup on it. Oh, hi there. My name is Mary Lawrence. This is my daughter, Charlie. We live right next door. My mom squeezed my shoulder. And this is our dear friend, Julia. Oh, it's nice to meet you, the woman said with a bright smile. My name is Helen Lester. Please, please come inside. My husband, Anthony, is just in the living room. We followed her through the house, and I couldn't help but wonder how quickly they had furnished everything inside. When I was here, the whole house was still bare. How did they do that all in just one night? Mr. Lester was sitting on the sofa staring at a black television without any movement. But when he heard us approach, he quickly turned towards us, although he didn't stand up. Anthony, honey, these are our new neighbors. Mary, Julia, and... She took a short pause as if she had to remember my name. And Charlie. His serious face swiftly turned into a smile, even bigger than the one of his wife's, though I could swear that I saw a twitch in there. Good day, he called out. Poor Anthony heard his leg working in the house. Helen's smile turned into a dramatic frown. How unfortunate. My mom responded in a tone that sounded slightly judgmental, though I couldn't say why. Jules and I stood behind her awkwardly that entire time until we heard a new noise calling hello into the house. Another neighbor with a basket full of muffins. What a lovely couple, weren't they? Though it was slightly odd that they never introduced that son that I heard about. He must have been in there somewhere, right? My mom asked as we walked back home. We left shortly after the other neighbors came in and Jules went back to her place. I shrugged. We didn't introduce Dad or Benny either. Yes, yes, all in good time, I guess. For the rest of the day, I couldn't shake the feeling that something about those people and the entire interaction was off. I didn't mention anything to Mom because whenever I tried... She responded in a very strict manner, and I probably would have just ignored my thoughts as I normally would. There's a new family every year. The only thing different about this one is that they live so incredibly close. I told myself that I felt some type of attachment as I personally had helped out with the house. But when I saw Alex, I realized that there was something much bigger going on. Now most people in Agsbury go to bed awfully early. My parents turn off all the lights before 11 and all the noises just disappear. When I'm not ready to sleep, I often sit in the nook by my window and draw something. It's quiet and relaxing most times, but that night I looked outside and saw a pale face staring at me with wide empty eyes from the window across the street. My body froze in a moment of shock. When my breath came back, it was short and rapid. I had recently gotten used to looking at the empty house and... I suppose for a moment I forgot that it wasn't empty anymore. But whoever was staring at me did not look alright. Through the darkness it was hard to say but this person kept scratching the window. And when our gazes met, he pushed his head against the window again and again and again. I couldn't say for sure but it seemed like he was screaming. Until all of a sudden, he was pulled away from the window and it all stopped. I'm ashamed to admit how long it took me to finally get into action. As my thoughts became clearer, I finally walked to my parents' bedroom trying to somehow explain what I had just witnessed. Charlie, this is more than absurd. Do you even hear yourself? My mother said in the aforementioned district tone. I know, but I swear something happened. We need to check on them. We've met the Lesters and they seemed like perfectly fine people. Now calm down, my mother said. We didn't meet the son. I shouted, to which my mother responded with a stern look. Now my dad, who was sleepy and groggy, chimed in. You met them. I thought we said that we would wait. My mother just shrugged and then dad got up from bed and left the room. Mom and I exchanged a quick look and then followed. Howard, what are you doing? 
Now my mom sounded more scared than straight. I thought that dad would go next door, but he walked to my room and straight to my window. And then he waved. Slowly, we walked up to the window, mom making sure that she was a step ahead of me. When I reached the window, I couldn't believe my eyes. Mr. and Mrs. Lester were standing by the window where I had witnessed the horrors earlier, looking at us with the exact same smile while waving. See, all is fine. It's dark, you must have hallucinated, Dad said. Yes, my mom added. Now let us let the neighbors sleep. I'll make you some warm milk to calm you down, Char. No, my dad jumped in. It's late. Go to bed, Charlie. And to be honest, I thought the subject would just be dropped. My parents didn't say a word the next day. I think we were all a bit surprised when the Lesters rang our doorbell at around noon the next day. And this time, they had their son with them. During daylight, they didn't look scary at all. The son's brown eyes appeared bloodshot but not empty. And his face wasn't that pale and had a nice touch of color. His hair that yesterday went in all directions was neatly styled back. My parents invited them inside and we all sat down in the living room. Dear Charlie, we want to sincerely apologize for Alex scaring you like that. Helen said while not blinking even once. A dumb boyish prank. The father awkwardly chuckled while gently nudging Alex, whose face distorted for just a fraction of a second. But then he really looked as if he had felt bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, that was really stupid of me, he said. I didn't mean to scare you. He sounded sincere. I looked at all the concerned faces around me and let out a short laugh. It's really okay, I was just surprised, not scared. I lied. The lie seemed to help though because suddenly, all the adults seemed far more relaxed. Well, now that the issue is resolved... How would you like to join us for a barbecue? Dad enthusiastically suggested. They stayed the whole afternoon. The Lesters were really nice, saying all the right things and even Mom was warming up. Alex was rather quiet but friendly and polite. He talked about how he liked to play soccer and that he already saw the sports fields that we have in Agsbury. Dad liked that. Then he asked if Alex would play video games with him, which he politely agreed to. So the three of us went inside while the parents stayed in the garden. Alex and I were alone in the living room for just a minute, sitting next to each other on the sofa while Benny went to get his games. So, how many people have you met here yet? I asked, trying to make small talk. Alex looked around the room really quickly and then he came really close to my face. I have no idea what happened last night, he whispered. I don't think I've ever met you, but... He pulled his shirt up a bit and pulled his pants down just enough to show something written on his lower stomach. No, not written, carved, with a knife or something similar from the looks of it, though the wound didn't appear fresh. It's upside down, he whispered, but can you read it? He pulled back quickly as we heard footsteps approaching, but I did see what it said. Charlie... The books in the library, the movies in the cinema, the games that we could play. All of them are limited to a specific collection. A way to mimic what was on the outside to give us a sense of having entertainment and choices. When in reality we only learned and saw what we were supposed to. Of course I didn't know it then. And I never should have known. I never would have figured it out if it weren't for that slight coincidence that got the suspicion rolling. Alex says that it might have been fate. I believe it was my dad. My name written on the stomach of a boy that I had never seen before had to mean something. Of course, after what I had seen in the night, I wasn't yet sure whether I could trust this Alex. I had been living a happy and fulfilled life in Axbury. There was never anything that I missed. Nothing that I desperately longed for. He was the only factor that led to the disruption of my belief system. And what kind of person would I be if I let some random guy do that? I had a mind of my own after all. So I tried to ignore the issue. I told myself that I would ask Alex to leave me alone and if he tried to bother me again, he should play his weird games on his own. 
I was set on that, but then Alex surprised me. For the next few days, we saw each other occasionally. We'd get the mail from outside at the same moment. We'd be at the grocery store picking something up for our parents, or we would be at the sports center at the same time. And every time, he was being awfully normal. During each of those occasions, Alex acted like everyone else. He waved, said hello, or he'd ask me something simple like, Do you know where the green beans are? But it never went further than that. He treated me just like a regular neighbor. He had entirely adapted to our way of living. And that's what got my blood boiling. He ignored the issue which resulted in me not being able to ignore it any longer. This boy had brought some kind of change to town. I just didn't know what exactly was going on. Of course, I couldn't talk to my parents about any of this. Not after the way they had reacted on the night that I saw these strange active Alex through his window. I didn't even tell Jules, my closest and longest friend. For reasons I couldn't explain, it felt like I had to keep it all to myself. In Axbury, we don't voice criticism or speak of bad emotions. Most of the time, we don't need to, and when you do feel negative, it feels silly to bother others with it. You don't want to be the odd one out. So, I thought the best thing that I could do would be to befriend Alex, to try and figure out more about him. So, this is where you usually hang out. Alex's gaze switched between Jules and me. We were sitting at the coffee house overlooking the marketplace, and getting him to join us for coffee was easy. I just acted like it was a spontaneous idea when I saw him helping his mom out in the yard. She was thrilled by the idea of him socializing as well. Not exclusively, but often. We usually come after school, but it's the holidays now, Jewel said. Alex nodded. It's nice, um, good coffee. He said and added three cubes of sugar to his cup. Yes, it's the absolute best. Well, to be honest, it's the same roast that you can get at the market as well, but it does taste nicer when somebody else brews it, I think. Jules kept talking. Alex nodded and kept adding sugar cubes to his coffee. That's a lot of sugar, I said when his cup was starting to overflow. Jules hadn't even noticed. Oh, Alex looked down. Sorry, I think I zoned out for a moment. Last night I... He was interrupted by the waitress who came over with a pot full of fresh coffee. Without even asking, she started pouring coffee into Alex's cup which was already filled to the brim. Oh, look at you, your drink is all sugared up. We should add a bit more caffeine or the sweetness will go to your head. She cheerfully said as she removed his cup and filled a new one with coffee, so hot that it looked like it was boiling inside of the cup. Alex was really fun once he had warmed up. He seemed witty and fit well into our little group. I was starting to think that he should come hang out with me and Jules more often. We sat in the coffee house for another hour that practically flew by, talking about all sorts of things. As it turned out that we had a lot of the same favorite movies, books, and artists which made me wonder how he had grown up. What was the place like where you had lived before? I asked. Alex didn't even think before answering. How oh, typical, not spectacular. A place to live, not to love. We had some neighbors but no real community and our house wasn't as nice as the one that we live in now. I thought his reply sounded a bit strange, but Jules nodded in agreement. Yeah, it makes sense. Your old one wasn't built by Charlie after all. Oh, I didn't build anything. I rolled my eyes. What about you guys? Did you always live in Axbury? I thought about it for a second. Well, ever since I can remember, so I suppose always. Jules nodded in agreement. So you were born here? Jules answered before I could. Oh, no, nobody is born here. You come to Axbury when you become a family. My mom said that you have to apply and they mostly consider people who already have children. It does make sense because the houses are all too big for just a couple or a single person. Yeah, that sounds logical. So you are probably just too young to remember moving here. Jules nodded. 
All I know is that our families must have come here only a year apart from each other, because Charlie and I have known each other since kindergarten. For some peculiar reason, she said that in a threatening tone. Was Jules afraid that Alex, as my new neighbor, would replace her as my friend? It felt flattering, though unnecessary. Alex ignored her and looked at me. What about your brother? How old is he? Like 10? Do you remember him being born? I opened my mouth to answer but couldn't when I felt a pulsating pain going through my left hand that was holding my coffee cup. I immediately dropped the cup which started spilling all over the table. What the? Oh dear, I'm sorry. You must be losing my mind missing your cup like that. Let me make that up to you with a free piece of pie. It was the waitress who, without me noticing, was back at the table. I hadn't even asked for a refill. On our cycle back home, all I could think about was Benny. He'd always been my brother, but I had never thought about his birth until Alex had asked about it. It must have been here in Agsbury, but why couldn't I remember anything about it? Jules and Alex were talking about all kinds of things on our way home, but I stayed silent. I was too occupied with my own thoughts. I hadn't even realized that we were already back on our street. Do you guys want to go to the cinema or something tomorrow? She said once we were in front of my house. Yeah, that sounds good. Alex said and I nodded. We said our goodbyes and Jules cycled on. Alex was just about to head home as well, but I grabbed him by the arm before he could. Why are you acting like nothing happened? I surprised myself with my sudden courage. Alex's face shifted for a second. His brows frowned, but then he forced it back to a smile. I'm trying to be normal, well, for my parents. He looked around the street. They like it here and it makes them happy, and I want to be happy too. I shouldn't have jumped on you like that. I just found it so weird that your name was on my skin when I had never even met you before. And I'm pretty sure that it has been on my stomach before we even moved here. Like somebody tried to make sure I wouldn't forget, you know. He shook his head before I could answer. Sorry, I think it's best if we just don't think about it any longer. I actually get an awful migraine when I try to. I'll see you tomorrow. Maybe Alex was able to shove his suspicions down, but I couldn't any longer. I contemplated talking to my parents about Benny's birth during dinner, but for some reason I just couldn't. It seemed like a bad idea, though I couldn't explain why. I acted normal, just like Alex, but that night I couldn't sleep again. I had never had trouble with a sleep before. Something about me had changed ever since the Lesters had moved in next door. And it wasn't just me who had acted differently. That night I realized that there was something wrong with my family as well. I was lying in bed, my eyes open and focused on the ceiling, my thoughts flowing in all sorts of directions. And then I heard it. A sound through the usually so suffocating silence. I got up to look at Alex's window but this time it wasn't coming from him. It was coming from downstairs. And that was strange. My parents were never up at night. My heart was racing inside of my chest as I slowly made my way down the stairs, following the voice of someone to the kitchen. It's hard to say where my nervousness was coming from. That was my home after all, the place that should make me feel safe. And the thing is, I wasn't scared of an intruder. We didn't have any crime in Axbury. It was the safest place that you could imagine. I was so scared because the person whose voice I was hearing was my father. He was speaking so quietly that I wasn't sure what he was muttering at first, but then I realized it was a name. Lucia. His whisper slowly became louder. Lucia. Lucia, you're dead. We are all dead. The unusual sight of my father at night like this talking that way, it sent a shiver down my spine. For a moment I just stood in the doorway, not sure what to do. Finally I whispered, Dad? With a sudden move, he turned around and our eyes met. I couldn't say which of us looked more distressed. They are growing corpses. You die the second that you set foot here, he said. What? 
My breathing stopped when I suddenly felt a touch on my shoulder. What's going on here? It was my mom, and I had never been happier to see her. Mom walked dad back upstairs to the room, and then she came back and heated up a cup of milk for me. Your father did something horrible, she said after a long silence, but he never meant to, he's a good man, a truly good man. Sometimes his head becomes a bit broken. She looked at me, wiping away a single tear from her cheek. Oh, but please don't worry, my child. I'll call the doctor tomorrow and he'll be fine. Go back to bed now. I'll bring you the milk, okay? She smiled at me and we hugged. For a moment, I really felt better and safe again. I walked towards these stairs but turned around one more time to ask my mother something that had been bugging me since the afternoon. Mom, what was the place like where we lived before here? My mother smiled and answered without thinking about it for even a second. In typical, not spectacular. A place to live, but not to love. We had neighbors, but no real community. And our house wasn't as nice as the one that we live in now. Getting rid of Jules wasn't easy, but it had to be done. I vividly remember meeting my best friend. It's one of the few memories that I have that appears somewhat clear in my mind. A happy moment without alteration. Of course, it was easier than because I was younger. Although I can't say how old for sure, I've been trying to remember when Benny was already born. I've been trying that for different memories, but he only appeared in more recent ones. But the image of Jules is as clear as day. She was like a ray of sunshine dressed in a white skirt with lots of bright lemons, almost the color of her hair. Her mom had the same lemons on her apron. We went over to their house after they had invited us to a barbecue. The parents were chatting loudly. Our moms connected right away and so did Jules and I. After we ate, we went inside and played games. Thinking about it now, it was a lot like the day that Alex's family came over. We liked to repeat stuff. After that day, we were inseparable. She introduced me to everything that I know and love. I used to look at her and feel like I belonged. The last time I looked at her, I wished that she would drop dead. Mom and dad were both gone. Mom had work to do, which was odd for a Sunday, but sometimes that's what it was like, and we never questioned her work. Dad had gone to some kind of play date with Benny. None of us had mentioned last night during breakfast. Jules and I were in my room getting ready for the cinema. I knew right away that there was a reason why she came to my place before. She wanted to talk about Alex. I meant to keep things to myself at least for now, but after the night I was feeling awfully nervous. Instead of drinking the milk last night, I poured it away because I didn't want to sleep. I wanted to think. Now with only two hours of sleep and my mind going in all directions, I started regretting my decision. It made me more emotional and less careful. When she asked about Alex, Jules probably wanted to know if I had a crush on him or something. You can imagine the look she gave me when I told her about everything else. The words came out of my mouth like vomit. The engraved name, the view from my window on his first night, the things that father said. I was pushing my fingernails in my palm of my hand to keep myself from starting to cry. He looks so scary, nothing like my dad. I whispered after I had poured out everything that had happened without a pause. Jules had been watching me carefully and quietly the entire time. But Jules, I don't think he's going crazy. I think he tried to warn me. I whispered the last part even though we were all alone in the house. My friend got up and sat down right next to me on the bed with no distance to move. She put her hands on top of mine, which were still formed into fists, and gently lifted up my fingers. And then she moved her hands to my wrists and grabbed them tightly. God, you were so stupid. Her tone was mellow, cold. What? She sighed. Insufferable, really. If it weren't for your mother, you'd probably be long dead. I don't even want to know how often your parents drug you, although I can assume... I stared at her face that showed not a single sign of emotion. Her grip became even tighter. 
I am so sorry, Charlie. I had hoped that we could earn our place in Agsbury alongside each other. Of course, I would have gotten married first and worked to be accepted as a member of my own house. And then you could have tried the same. We would have been like our moms. With our upbringing, we would have had many years to live. Now only one of us does. I tried to pull away, but now her nails were digging into my flesh. What on earth are you talking about, Jules? Only worthy ones are chosen to live in heaven, Charlie. Our families work so hard to come to Axbury. They spend all their time becoming important members of the community. One day, they will be chosen to become the soil that nourishes our earth. The earth that gives us happiness, fortune, and health in return. And finally, she was showing emotion but in a way that made my blood freeze. Her eyes were opened wide the entire time as if she had forgotten how to blink and her teeth were grinding loudly against each other as she tried to force the biggest smile that I had ever seen. Where did you learn all this? What soil? You mean when we die and are buried? When we are offered and buried, silly. But only when it is our time to leave Agsbury. And I have no intention of leaving the community anytime soon. But you, she sighed. You don't understand it, Charlie. Even with all the years your parents have tried to prepare you, you've stayed clueless. Do you know how hard it is to be friends with somebody so dumb? If it weren't for your lovely mother, I would have abandoned you much sooner. She loosened her grip slightly and tilted her head. Oh, poor Charlie, you look so scared. Oh, don't worry, it'll all be fine. You won't be turned into soil before you turn 18. I will talk to your mother and she will wipe your little memory as gently as she can. And then we can have a bit more time together. While all her words were like daggers in my brain, I had to focus. It was possible that my friend had lost her mind, but after everything that I had witnessed these past days, I think the truth was much more complicated. And whatever happened, I couldn't let her talk to my parents. I had to keep my memory clear. So as Jules kept blabbering about her fruitful future, I slammed my head against hers in a moment of surprise. I didn't even think about it. My body simply started to act and my brain tried hard, and there was no time to keep up. She instinctively let my arms go and I got up as quickly as I could, ignoring the pain in my face. She followed fast and grabbed my shirt to pull me down to my knees. Help! She shouted but I shut her up by pushing my elbow into her stomach. She dropped to the ground and I quickly jumped on top of her, pushing my knee into her chest. As the adrenaline rushed through my body, I tried to think of my next step. I wasn't used to fighting anyone, and then we were interrupted. What the heck? A new voice spoke. It was Alex who had come inside without our knowledge. Nobody in Bloody Axbury ever locks their door. Get her off me! Jules started crying. Alex didn't move. He looked at our bloody faces. When Jules said, Charlie has gone mad, it looked as if something inside of him had clicked. Do you have tape, a rope maybe? Jules and I both stared at him. I took a deep breath. Jules said that my mother drugs me. Can you hold her down while I look for something? It was in the honey. There was no scent to it, but it made the most sense. She kept it hidden at the back of the highest cupboard, and we never had honey with breakfast or any other meal, but it was always in my milk. Getting Jules to swallow the honey mixture I made wasn't easy, but we had managed. My heart was racing the entire time. My mind was so focused on hoping that nobody would come home that I didn't even have time to process what had happened. Together with Alex, I had drugged my best friend, tied her up and hid the sleeping girl in my closet. The pain only got to me as Alex and I cycled all the way to Axbury Lake, and I told him everything that I had learned from my father and Jules. Axbury Lake was my favorite place because I could always go there and be alone. Of course, back then I didn't know that the people of Axbury regularly fed it with corpses because they believed that it nourished our water. Alex looked surprised after everything that I told him, though not as much as me, maybe because his old life was more recent than mine. I don't know why I never questioned anything before, 
Hagsbury really does feel like heaven, but lately, everyone seems to be breaking a little. Jules said something about them turning people into soil, and when they find me, I stop talking. We need to get away, Alex said firmly. There's no place in Hagsbury that we can hide, and we can never get far enough on our bikes. And what about our families? I wrapped my arms around my legs. So what now? He asked. I shrugged. I'm sorry that I pulled you into this. I took a deep breath. Why did you even help me and not Jules? Alex started tapping his fingers on the ground nervously. When I saw you there, something in my mind had shattered. For a moment, I remember the night that we came here. Your dad was there and other adults. They... He paused for a moment. They hurt me. Tried to make me comply or whatever. Jules was there as well with all the adults. I think it was some kind of initiation and she seemed weirdly into it. She had that look that your mom always has. The one that my parents now have as well. I swallowed. Was it that night that you carved my name into you? Yes, I don't remember everything but I know that it was bad. And it's our families that did this to us. We need to get help or... Charlie. Both of us turned around in the same second to see where the voice was coming from. It was my dad. Walking down the path that leads from the street to the lake. I jumped up. Crap, what now? Alex looked just as clueless as me. And even more afraid when his eyes met the ones of my dad. At the top of the path I saw a car. We didn't have a car, nobody in Agsbury did. There was no need for the residents to have a car. We had bikes for short trips inside the town and if we wanted, we could buy skateboards or roller skates but nothing with a motor. If you're somebody with important privileges, you do drive a car at times. For example, if you pick up a new family and dad was a trusted resident. But I had no idea why he had it now. Was he trying to get rid of us? Get in the car, now. Alex and I both turned to the water for a split second. Should we try to swim? I didn't even know where the lake ended. We don't have much time, get in the car now. Benny's already inside, hurry. How did you know that we were at the lake? After I found jewels in your closet and saw that your bike was gone, I just assumed. You used to run away to the lake often after we had moved to Axbury. I think you were too young to understand the full extent, but your gut already knew that this place was wrong. I wish mine had as well. Only as we had reached roads that I had never seen before, my heartbeat started slowing down. Lately, I had been too afraid of my own family. If my dad hadn't mentioned Benny, I probably would have jumped in the water. But now I was glad that I hadn't. After my father finally, for the first time in my life, really spoke the truth. Axbury was a paradise, a place that you didn't choose but had to be chosen for. If you showed enough determination and love to grow this community, we met one of their spokesmen on a holiday once. He told us about this wonderful place where families live together in happiness, where there's no crime, no hate. Of course, we didn't believe much of what he was saying at first, but they get to you eventually. You were only 10 back then and we didn't have much money and little support from our respective families. Axbury was going to fill all those voids for us. So we wrote our application and had many interviews and trials. It took almost a year until we had finally received the acceptance letter. Your mother couldn't believe her eyes. I had never seen her happier than that day. Alex and I stayed silent, sucking in all the words that my dad was speaking. I was sitting at the front next to my dad while Alex was in the back with a fast asleep Benny. There were so many rules and we weren't allowed to conceive more children. We weren't allowed to leave, even for vacation. We weren't allowed to own a car. When I think about it now, I believe that we were insane for wanting it, but they had a way to be persuasive. I didn't like where things were going. And we were happy, we had convinced ourselves to be. Your mother especially. Even when she had learned about the ritual, once a year a family is chosen. Often it happens when their youngest child turns 18. 
I want to spare you the horrifying details, but these families never truly leave Axbury. They believe, and I used to as well, that dying and becoming a part of Axbury's grounds was the greatest honor. The town feeds on the dead and pays its residents with good fortune. My stomach started churning. But wait, we had moved here before Benny was born. This isn't adding up, I said. My dad nervously looked through the mirror at Benny. They don't always wait until the child turns 18. He needed a new family. I looked at the sweet face of the boy that I only knew as my brother, and I couldn't help but imagine what they would have done to his parents. This couldn't be real. Dad, where are we going? He took a deep breath. We're getting away before they notice that the car is gone. Where to, I'm not sure yet. He looked at Alex. I know this is a lot for you too, and I'm sure you don't want to leave your parents, but... He stopped talking. Why now? Alex suddenly asked. Why should we even believe you? I know you were there on my first night. Why didn't you help us? He was almost shouting now. Because I needed time to become myself again. Normally, when a new family comes, their children are still pretty young, and they can be persuaded easily. For you, it was hard. Your parents tried to talk you into it, but you couldn't be convinced. But they wanted this so much and showed all this determination. They'd have done anything, and I saw it on the night that you moved in. We were going on pathways that I had never seen before, luckily with no people in sight. I can't believe other residents haven't tried to flee. I wondered how people could be persuaded so easily, but remembered that I had been the same until now. But the moment something in my mind really shattered was when I heard them call you by your real name, Charlie. My dad continued. Alex and I exchanged a confused look. It reminded me of how they wipe everything from our old lives. You having the current name of my daughter. He looked at Alex through the mirror. It reminded me of a real one. Lucia, I whispered. A tear was forming in the corner of my dad's eye. I'm so sorry for everything we've done to you children. I pulled you aside that night. He was talking to Alex again. Pressured you not to forget your name. I thought that I could do something at least. But it took me some time to collect the courage and formulate my plan. I wanted to get more children out of there, but... They have very smart ways to trick the outside world as well. If I went to the authorities, they would only put me in jail for kidnapping. I felt like I would throw up at any second. Dad, what about Mom? Your mother would happily die to become soil for the grounds of Axbury, and she would take us with her. For now, we need to save ourselves.